Hi, I'm Vinod Kumar Panchbhavi. I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery and chief of foot and ankle surgery at University of Texas Medical Branch. The procedure I'm going to demonstrate now is uh, plating of the distal fibula. So for this, we would like to mark out the bony contours of the fibula. So this is the back of the fibula, distal end, and if you go anteriorly, <clears throat> and more proximally, you can, you can feel or palpate the fibula and you can draw out the outline of the fibula on the skin. <clears throat> okay, so, um, and the, ins the ex exposure for the distal fibula, for fixing the fibular fractures can vary. Now, if you want to have a posterior flap, the incision is way at the back. Or if you want a direct lateral approach, it usually is in middle of the anterior and posterior border of the fibula. So you can curve a little at the distal end. If you want to expose it further distal to the tip, you may need to do that. Sometimes in fracture is very distal. So you may need to have a further distal exposure. So in the distal part of the incision, uh, the skin is very close to the bone itself. So there's not a lot of tissues. It's just skin, subcutaneous tissue, and then you're directly onto the bone. <coughs> um, so, but in the proximal part of this exposure, we have to be careful not to damage the superficial peroneal nerve which can come very, it can vary in its location, but <clears throat> just after you expose the skin, you have to be careful not to damage the superficial peroneal nerve. In the distal part, like I said, you can go down to the bone very quickly and that's right down to the bone. <clears throat> Once you expose the distal part of the fibula, then you can use a periosteal elevator or a freer <coughs> and and then just uh, move this uh, tissues away to expose the distal part of the fibula. So the nerve is often coursing anti in the anterior part of the flap. So you can use a blunt dissection to avoid damage to the superficial perineal nerve. <coughs> So again, depending on where the fibular fracture is, uh, you may need a wider exposure. The more proximal you go, the, 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 the more there is a risk of injury to the superficial perineal nerve. Um, now that's the back of the fibula. It's important to feel, uh, elevate the periosteum on the lateral surface, <clears throat> just enough. I mean, obviously you're uh, elevating the periosteal surface to enable two things. One is the reduction of the fracture and the other is to apply uh, the, the plate on the distal fibula. That's the only two objectives you have to expose. As you can see, there is a fracture now, which we created just now. <coughs> um, typically, it's a spiral fracture. And once you expose the distal end of the fracture, which goes all the way almost into the joint, and the back, at the back it's more proximal. So once you mobilized enough to visualize the entire fracture plane, uh, you may want to put the bump in such a way that you can expose the fracture and then shift the bump under the heel to kind of aid in reduction and providing some stability at the fracture site. So once you have the fracture exposed, you need to put a reduction clamp on it and often a lobster uh, clamp serves the purpose. Now, what I do is I make a little shelf here to introduce the uh, the clamp at times if uh, <coughs> if the injury has not does, done the damage itself. So that so, so there you go. So now you can see. <coughs> oh, the clamp is not obstructing the view, so you can see the fracture is closed. 
see okay. So, after you do that sometimes you can also put additional clamp uh, <coughs> and it has to be a little pointy clamp like this on the other side of uh, the, of the point where you might want to put a lag screw. So, this provides stability on both, si both sides of the intended placement of the, um, the screw. As you can see I made a little tiny entry point for the uh, placement of a lag screw. You can see that is the fracture plane over here and that is the lag screw is going to go perpendicular to the fracture. Okay, so, we have a over drill. <coughs> and you want you remember to drill only the near cortex because we are putting this screw by lag technique. Okay. Then use the other side and a smaller drill <coughs> to centralize the, the far hole or the hole in the distal fragment. So, through that previously made hole I am going further and going across the fracture into the far cortex. <coughs> I use a depth gauge and you can actually see the tip of the depth gauge if you need it to, but if you hook that area and then get the measurement is usually 18 to 20, this is 18, 18 please. So, again you have to maintain the direction of this screw. Now, if you choose a wrong direction, it the tip of the screw can buttress uh, or can push against the intact cortex and not engage the hole and actually stress the, the bone pieces and actually can cause a snap in the the bone spikes. So, it is very important to maintain the direction of the screw and gradually advance the screw. So, that the tip engages the hole and actually causes compression. You will see if you have if you have done a good job uh, sometimes blood will come out or tissue fluid will come out from this fracture plane as you can see here and that compresses that fragment completely. Now, at this stage you can take the clamps off and then obviously, you have used fluoroscopy to uh, make sure that you know the talus is main reduced in the in the ankle mortise. Uh, at this stage now you select the length of the plate. Here we have a contoured fibular plate. You can use the pickups. And, and line it up with the fibula and use fluoroscopy to check the length of the plate you need. So, <coughs> that is the, the proximal ex extent of the fracture is over here, distal extent is over there. So, you need at least um, 4 holes, uh, 4 cortices on the uh, <coughs> other side of the fracture. So, this could be 1 or 2 holes long. So, we can try out a slightly smaller <coughs> plate over here. Now, this is little too short. Uh, if you want to err, you always err on the side which is a little longer plate. So, you provide the stability. So, <coughs> this contoured plate will sit neatly uh, on the distal fibula. It is important to ensure that the plate is not too far anterior or too far posterior in its proximal proximal end and it is lining up nicely against the lateral surface of the fibula. Once you like the position we check to the fluoroscopy you can use a temporary olive. So, again I am trying to make sure that 
the anterior border, that is the anterior border of the fibula and that is the posterior border of the fibula. The plate is nicely lined up against the fibula and then I can put the olive <coughs> pin to lock the proximal end. All right, so now we got the temporary stabilization of the fibula plate to the fibula. Again, you can check uh, check the positioning of the plate, the reduction of the ankle, uh, uh, the talus and the ankle mortise, and also the positioning on a lateral uh, projection of the uh, with the X-ray. <coughs> if you are satisfied with that, then we can start off by putting screws. Um, So, when you are putting these screws in the fibula, you should always look for that resistance for the near cortex and then the resistance goes, then you get the resistance back at the far cortex. So, that means you are not drilling the cortical wall, but you are putting the screws appropriately. You measure the depth, usually about a 12 or 14 millimeters, this is 14. In the part distal to the fracture, the, the screws should not cross into the lateral malleolus, so into the lateral gutter. So, these are only unicortical. So, here you want to use a locking screw. <coughs> Often the bone is very cancellous, so you can check the length again on the, radio, on the fluoroscopy and uh, it is about 12. There you are. <coughs> drill again, please. Then we drill the rest of the screws. Like I mentioned before, in situations of osteoporotic fractures or if there is a syndesmosis injury, if you find disruption of the intraosseous membrane, uh, at this stage you can do a, a test <coughs> to see if the intraosseous membrane is uh, torn or if there is instability at the syndesmosis between the fibula and the tibia. So, once you do an external rotation test or you can uh, put a hook <coughs> to see if the fibula moves in relationship to the tibia, then you need to stabilize the fibula to the tibia and reduce the syndesmosis. And, and for this, I would like to use uh, two tibio, uh, two, uh, two syndesmotic screws also called as uh, tibio profibula screws. <coughs> Again, this should be about a centimeter or two centimeters above the plafond, and these two screw holes give ideal opportunities for placement of syndesmotic screws. And I use the syndesmotic screws often in situations where there is osteoporosis. So, for this, you need a longer screw, and, this, and the trajectory is a parallel to the tibial plafond. And, uh, and also slightly to, uh, um, anteriorly into the tibia. If you do not aim it anterior in the, into the tibia, you may miss the tibia because the fibula is slightly posterior in relation to the tibia. Now, only three cortices need to be drilled. The fourth cortice is not uh, drilling is not necessary for the fourth cortex. So, these are quite long screws, usually 45 or 45. <coughs> and these provide a tremendous amount of stability also, like I said, in the situations of osteoporotic ankle fractures.
you can see how powerful they can be. They can actually distort the plate. See, they are so they, the grip is so powerful in the tibia that if you if you do not pay attention, if you have to do this under fluoroscopic guidance, if you do not do that, you can be too powerful and actually distort the plate and the fibula too. So you can overdo it. So be careful about that. So you can put another screw here. <coughs> Again, make sure that you aim it slight anterior into the tibia, otherwise that is the first cortex, that is the second cortex and there is the third cortex which is the tibia and under fluoroscopy you are doing this, you are making sure that they are parallel and we draw the drill, you have the depth gauge. Again 45 will do nicely here. So there you can see each, each advance you can see how I am deforming the plate itself. So sometimes if you have overdone it you can back one or two threads off if you need to, but, but this is very powerful. So there you have it. So basically we have a fracture here, we fixed the fracture initially by a lag screw and then we put the plate on the fibula, you can see that is the anterior margin then the posterior border or anterior border of the fibula, posterior border of the fibula <coughs> and the plate and we were very careful to preserve the <coughs> branch of the superficial nerve here. Take up, please. <coughs> That is the superficial nerve as you can see right there. Okay, so in the distal part of the exposure, um, we are directly onto the bone, but uh, as we extend our incision more proximally, you have to be careful about the, uh, the nerve. This concludes the procedure of fibular plating.